to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ jesus said the seed is the word of god luke chapter 8 verse number 11. we welcome you today to our study of the gospel of luke Luke presents Jesus as the ideal person. Luke chapter 2, verse 52, Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, favor with God, and favor with man. In all four aspects, physically, intellectually, socially, and spiritually, Jesus is presented as the ideal person, as the one we must look to in every way. And so we're so glad you've joined us. For our Bible study today on the Gospel of Luke, we want to encourage you, if you don't have your Bible, take just a moment, locate your Bible in your home, and let's get it out as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study today. As always, today's lessons are brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to visit their assembly, whether that be on Sunday morning or Sunday night, Wednesday for Bible study. You will find people there who love God, who are concerned about God's Word, and who ultimately want men and women to be saved. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more about the church or the plan of salvation or, or worship in spirit and truth, You'll find there who, people there who'd be happy to sit down, open up the Word of God, and would be joyous to study that Word with you as we look to God for guidance. Friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your journey to know God and His will better. Please check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all of our lessons, video, audio, transcripts, study questions, a host of written material. It's all available to you free of charge, and you can access that anytime. And so check out our website. If you'd like to have a copy of this series of lessons on the Gospel of Luke, or any book in the Bible, both old, we have books, uh, lessons on both old and New Testament books, all of them. If you'd like to have a copy of any lesson of the Bible or any topic that we have available, we'll be glad to make that available to you free of charge. Go to our website or you can call or write to us. You can fill out a media request form from our website and uh, you can receive uh, instantly a digital download or if you need a hard copy, a DVD or CD, we'd be glad to mail that to you free of charge as well. And friend, in the fast-paced world we live in where everybody has a smartphone, won't you download the Gospel of Christ app from the respective play stores? It's a great way that you can study God's Word with us in a fast-paced world, take time every day to study the Word and grow closer to God and His will. We now turn our attention to the latter half, we say, of the book of Luke. We're going to be thinking about Luke chapter 8 following today and the lessons that are taught there. But now as Jesus ramps up his ministry and reaching out to the lost, he gives this parable of the sower and the parable of the seed. And, and you've got the, this sower who goes out to sow and he casts that seed. And the seed falls on four different types of soil. Some good soil, some thorny, some stony, some that springs up immediately. And we find that, that, that those soils represent the heart. But listen to what the seed is. Luke chapter 8. The Bible records for us in Luke chapter 8 verse number 11 that the seed is the Word of God. That sower, representative of the one who proclaimed the message, his part was just simply to, to sow the seed, to spread the word. The seed then would take root in some people's heart, good soul. Others that were thorny or stony or ones that sprung up immediately and then the sun, that was dependent upon the heart. Friend, our responsibility, here's where the power is. The power is in the word of God. God's word is living, powerful, sharper 
They need a two-edged sword. Hebrews 4 verse 12. The Word of God is what saves souls. Romans 1 verse 16. But that, that seed has to be willing to take root. You've got to have the right heart. Jesus emphasized in this lesson the need for our heart to be pliable to the Word of God, for our heart to be softened so that the Word of God can take root and we can develop and be a good seed, a good plant that produces for God and for His cause. And so are we willing to accept the seed into our life? And are we willing to make our heart soft so that the Word can really take root, can spring down into our life and really be what God wants it to be? What kind of soul? What kind of soul are you? What kind of soul am I? Is the Word of God able to prick our heart? Acts 2 verse 37, and make us what God wants us to be. Then in Luke chapter 8, we're reminded of as that seed enters our life, the need to carefully listen. Look at what Jesus said about hearing the seed, hearing the Word of God in Luke 8, 18. Jesus said, Therefore, take heed how you hear. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. Take heed how you hear. How do you listen when the Word of God is taught? Do you listen thinking, I already know that? Do you listen thinking, I'm smarter than that? Do you listen thinking, maybe this will be over quickly and I can move on and do something? How? What's your attitude and motive and why are you listening? Take heed how you hear. I need to listen carefully to him that has ears to hear. Let him hear, Revelation 2 and 3 says. I need to listen with an eye toward eternity. This can help me. If I listen carefully to God's Word, it'll help me one day to live with God in heaven. I need to listen with an eye toward seeing myself as I really am and making necessary changes. James 1 verses 19 through 21, He who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the Word, this one will be blessed. God's Word is like a mirror that I've got to let look into my life and see what changes, what things need to be addressed, and how I can be a better person. And so think about not just what you're hearing. That's important. I need to hear Jesus. I need to hear the Word of God. But think about your motive, how you hear, the way you do it, why you listen, and how important it is to listen carefully to God and His Word. And friend, here's why. Jesus is looking for people who will truly commit to Him and to His will. Now, what do we mean when we say truly commit? Look at Jesus' words in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. This is what real commitment is all about. Luke chapter 9, I want to direct your attention to verse number 23 to, to what it really means to commit to Christ. The Bible says this, Then Jesus said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. In Luke 9.23, when we think about real commitment and what that means and how we ought to live for Jesus Christ, here's the idea of that. Jesus taught these things are necessary to make a real commitment to him. Luke 9, verse 23, Jesus said, You've got to have a desire. If any man desires to come after me, you've got to want it. You've got to want it more than anything else. You've got to want to go to heaven and put God first above all else. If anyone desires to come after me, you've got to deny. You've got to have a denial of self. It's no longer about what I want, how I want to live, and what God wants or what I want to do. I've got to learn to say no to my passions and desires and my selfish interest and put God first. And then you've got to have a dedication. Take up your cross daily and follow me. I've got to have a dedication to follow Jesus above all else. That cross might represent Whatever burden, whatever care, whatever difficulty I've got to deal with this in life, the cross was a, a symbol of shame. Whatever I've got to bear, I've got to take that up every day and make a commitment to follow Jesus. Follow in His footsteps. 1 Peter 2, verse 21 and 22. And so being a Christian, 
following Christ, that takes real commitment every day, and you've got to be careful that you don't let other things get in the way and get off track in your commitment to put Jesus first. You see, I want to seek first the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 9 or Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. I want to have the mind of Christ, Philippians 2, verse 5, and I want to realize that to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. And so are, are we really making a commitment above all else to put Jesus and His will before our own? Let me show you what it's like if you don't do that. Look at Jesus' words in Luke chapter... What's it like to half-heartedly follow Jesus? Look in Luke chapter 9, verse number 62 with me. The Bible says this in Luke chapter 9, verse number 62. And Jesus said to him, talking about the cost of discipleship, Jesus said to this man, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Friend, you're, you can't be what God wants you to be if you keep looking back. Think about the illustration. Have you ever done much farming? Especially, let's say you're working with a plow and you're working with a, maybe you're driving a tractor and you're plowing a field. To plow that field straight, you don't look back. You look forward. You find a focal point in the distance. You focus on that and that'll help you to plow a straighter path. If you're always looking back, if ever so often as you're working in the field, you're looking back, time you get to the end of that row, what's it going to look like? I'm afraid it's going to be crooked. You can't look back and really make a straightforward progress for the gospel of God. As a Christian, when you put your hand to the plow, when you say, I'm going to commit to Jesus, I'm going to take up my cross daily and follow Him. If you are constantly looking over your shoulder, looking back to your former life and all the things you thought were fun then, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back, you can't really be fit for the kingdom of God because your interests are divided. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, you cannot love God and mammon or worldly riches. You've got to make a commitment to leave the past in the past. Like Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward to those things which are ahead, I pre reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's the idea. Forget the past, reach forward to the things that are ahead, press onward in the direction of heaven. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. And so you can't keep looking back. You've got to stay focused on what's ahead if you're going to be what God wants you to be. And then, my friend, you also have to consider others around you. Two greatest commandments, what are they? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. As I focus on being committed to Jesus, I can't just run roughshod over others in the process. I've got to think about, do I love my neighbor as myself? And that leads us to this question. Who is my neighbor, by the way? Jesus taught us who our neighbor is in Luke chapter 10. Would you look with me in your Bible in Luke chapter 10? My commitment to Christ means I also want to do good and help others as I can. Luke chapter 10, verse 29, the Bible says, A man wanting to justify himself said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave it to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three, the Levite, the priest or the Samaritan? Which of these three uh, was, was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy to him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. And so, friend, as you think about putting God first 
as you think about serving God in every way, as you strive to live your life for Jesus Christ and for the truth, I want you to know this. You've got to be considerate of others as well. It's not a one-way street with you the only one on it. There's others also that are trying to love God. And they're my neighbor, and my responsibility is to help them. Think about this, this example Jesus used. Religious people, the priest and the Levite, they see this man who's fallen among thieves. Uh, they, one of them just passed by on the other street. Another one goes by and looks at him. He passes by. They, that's the last thing they want to deal with. And these are people who claim to love God. And then the one who's looked down on the most, the Samaritan, he's the one who actually loves his neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Anyone who's in need. Who's responsible to help him? I am, and you are. If I'm going to do as the Bible says, and not just love God, but love my neighbor as myself, then friend, when I find somebody in need, the Christian's responsibility is to help those who are hurting. The Christian's responsibility is to do good unto all men. Galatians 6, verses 9 and 10. Take care of the widows and the orphans in their affliction. James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Jesus, here's the example of Jesus. Jesus fed the poor. He healed the sick. He helped those who were hurting. He talked to those who were downtrodden and in need. You can't pass by on the other side of the street and sweep the proverbial problem under the rug. My responsibility is to help, to do good to reach out to those who are hurting. And so here's what's easy. It's easy to say to yourself, imagine what the Levite and the priest are thinking. Man, I'm on the way to the temple of God. I've got big business, serious business in the temple of God. If I stop and deal with this, it'll stop me from doing everything I need to do as a Levite and a priest to help God. This, will, this would likely disqualify them from their service because they might become unclean according to the old law and it's just going to mess everything up and I've got such important business to do that this is going to get in the way of it. And so I might not be able to, but somebody will come behind me and take care of it. They weren't being the neighbor they should have been. You know, the problem may be what I need to deal with right then in helping someone. Imagine the good impact that had on the Good Samaritan. What about my life and yours? It's easy to pass by when somebody's got struggles and just keep going on. It takes more effort to help, to get out, to get your hands dirty, and to do what God wants us to do. And friend, that's what Jesus did all of his life. Jesus went about doing good and helping those who are in need. Then in Luke chapter 11, Jesus then moves on to discuss the idea of prayer. Prayer is one of the important parts of a Christian life. And I want you to see the example of what Jesus, uh, John's disciple, said in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. The Bible says, Now it came to pass, as Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he had stopped, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Don't you love that mindset there to begin with? Lord, teach us. They heard Jesus pray and they were impressed. And so they said, I want to pray like that. How can I pray like that? Lord, I need you to teach me how to pray like that. First off, I want you to think about this mindset with me. I want the attitude of Jesus' disciples in every aspect to be my attitude. Lord, teach us. I want the heart of Samuel who said, speak Lord, your servant hears, 1 Samuel 3. I want the attitude of Isaiah in Isaiah 6, Lord, here am I, send me. And I want the attitude of the disciples, Lord, teach me. I want to be open and ready to learn from God and His will. And then we learn about the power of prayer. Lord, teach us to pray. Prayer is not something you just wake up one day and you're an expert at it. The disciples weren't. They needed Jesus to teach them how to pray. And of course, we've got lessons on the subject of prayer. We encourage you to look at those lessons as well because there is much to learn from the life and ministry of Jesus about prayer. But friend, just to emphasize how important it is, listen to what prayer does. Prayers, in prayer, we come boldly 
to the throne of grace that we might find mercy and grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4, 16. The Bible says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails or overcomes much. James 5, verse 16. And so prayer is such a, a powerful aspect that I want to be taught by the Lord, by the Word of God, how to be better in prayer because in prayer, I have the ability to communicate with my Creator, my God, who promises, cast all your cares upon me, I care for you. 1 Peter 5, verse number 7. Now, let's turn our attention to a man. As we thought about commitment today, I, I want you to turn your attention with me to a man who's whose priorities were all out of whack, and he suffered spiritually because of it. Look in your Bible in Luke chapter 12 with me. Probably one of the sadder scenes in the Gospel of Luke is this man. He has so much potential, but he squanders it on the wrong things. Luke chapter 12. I want you to look in verses 15 through 21. And Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. There I'll store all my crops and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Listen to this, though. But God said to him, You fool! This night your soul will be required of you. Then whose things will those be which you provided? So is he, here's the point, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You know, this was a good, this was a good businessman. He'd made a lot of good business decisions. His crop had yielded plentifully. He had a good crop year, so much so that he's thinking ahead. Here's what he said to himself. I, I, I've got so much crop, been so plentiful, I'm going to pull down my barns and build greater barns. Listen, there wasn't anything wrong with him being a good businessman. He had been blessed with a plentiful crop. Wasn't anything wrong with pulling down his barns and building bigger barns necessarily. His business ventures were probably good and sound in some ways, and he'd been blessed because of that. But here's the point. That man, he said to himself, take it easy. Eat, drink, and you've got everything taken care of. Your life is going great. Everything's planned ahead. You can relax because everything's taken care of. Uh-oh. He left out the most important thing, though. God said to that man, you fool. What? What did he forget? What went wrong? You fool, this night will your soul be required of you. That man who had been good in business, that man who had a blessed crop year, that man who is planning ahead physically, forgot the most important thing. He forgot to plan for eternity. I wonder how many people are like that. We spend a lot of time and energy at our jobs. We spend a lot of time taking care of our families. We spend a lot of time on financial security. We think ahead and, and plan for problems and difficulties and maybe set a little money back in case you have an emergency fund. What were to happen to you tonight if your life ended? Have you planned ahead, spiritually speaking? Here's the point. The whole point of what Jesus said is in verse 21. So is he who is rich, but not toward God. This man had made plans. He was taken care of for the future. Didn't have anything to worry about. Only that future was short-sighted. He had not thought about the future beyond this life. What about me and you? Are you prepared for eternity? Are we prepared for eternity? What do we mean by that? Well, friend, you've got to make changes in your life. Look at Luke chapter 13. Preparing for eternity means I've got to make changes in my life where is necessary. Look at what Jesus said in Luke 13 in verse 3 and in verse 5. Jesus says this, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. 
Friend, if I'm going to be prepared for the future, that means I've got to make changes in my life here. I may not be able to keep living the way I've been living. I may not be able to say the things I've been saying. I may not be able to do the things I've been doing. If those don't align with the will of God, preparing for eternity means I've got to stop doing those things. I've got to repent. Or like this man in Luke 12, I'm going to perish. What else does it mean? It means I've got to humble myself. Listen to Luke 14, 11. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Friend, I've got to have the humility to say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I've got to have the humility to say, I've sinned. I've erred exceedingly. I've played the fool, just like Samuel said or Saul said in 1 Samuel 15. I need the humility to say, I need God, and I've got to do what he says. What's going to happen? Friend, this is what we're talking about that's so important today. The Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed a man once to die and then the judgment. Like it or not, ready for it or not, want it to happen or not, one day you're going to draw your last breath and you're going to be thrust into eternity. Are you ready? Have you prepared for that day? All the preparations in this life will matter nothing if you're not ready for that day. Have you made preparation for the other side? Have you believed in Jesus as the Son of God? John chapter 8, verse 24. Have you repented of sin in your life and given your life over to God? Acts chapter 3, verse 19, repent and turn that your sins might be blotted out. Have you made that confession? I believe Jesus is the Christ the Son of the living God, Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And friend, to have every sin washed away, to be saved, and to get into Christ. Have you been baptized in water? Peter said in Acts 2, 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And God will add to the church daily those who are being saved. Acts 2 verse 47. We are so thankful that you joined us for our study of the Gospel of Luke today. We hope you'll join us next time as we finish out the beautiful book of Luke with Jesus as the ideal person. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of